Good morning. Hey, it's good to be together and to worship. And to, I'm so excited. I'm so glad we're able to come back and worship together. And I don't know about you, if you enjoy it. Uh, I know a lot of you are not able to come or you haven't chose to come. But man, something powerful happens when we worship together. So we look forward to the time where we can just be together and just shout the roof off this place and uh, several other places around Delaware. So God bless you. It's good to be together. Hey, you know what? Every year we do a time uh, around this time of prayer, 21 days of prayer. We believe it's people are in a mood for shifting, like it's the fall. There's usually school starting back and <laughs> whatever that means at the moment. Uh, people are wanting to get back in some kind of routine. So setting aside 21 days to just pray and ask God to move and to save souls and to work in your lives and your your family's lives, your neighbor's lives, your fellow school members and teachers. Well, we need to be praying for our teachers now, don't we? Uh, this, uh, oh, so many things to be going on. But we're going to have 21 days of prayer beginning today. So start praying. Take just a few moments. And if you'll go to our church app, which is, you can download that app if you don't have it. It's uh, Love of Christ Church DE. And you know what the DE is for. And uh, DE, and just download that. And then you can go right to the 21 days. There's like 12 different key prayer points we've recently updated them just to make sure we're focusing on things about what we're all dealing with right now in this nation and so you can pray along takes a moment just to pray for one of those or two of them or however many you feel led but also we're going to be having three nights of prayer where we're gathering live and that's on Wednesday night so the next three Wednesday nights we're going to be gathering live at the Bear Campus and we're going to be worshiping for just a short period of time then we're going to go into intercessory prayer time where we're just praying, praying quietly together, agreeing together, and then we close it out with several people really praying and leading us all, and then we can all agree. And so we'd love for you to come out on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. It only lasts one hour, and we're really good at keeping the time because we know your life is busy. But if you can't join us live, join us online wherever you are in the world we know you're watching all over join us for that period of time and we're going to be praying and you agreeing and we're agreeing for your prayers and let's just see God do great things so we're excited about that just get involved with prayer hey I'm continuing a series on uh, the really the fruit of the spirit we call it fruitology which is the elements of relationships healthy relationships and that every one of these elements of the fruit of the spirit are needed and powerful in their relationship builders and absence of them really strain and hurt and, and bring down relationships but not only our relationships with our friends our families our spouses our kids but most importantly with God Every one of these elements really build on our relationship with God. So that's what we've been weaving in each week as we take a look at it. And we've been looking at our scripture out of Galatians 5.22. And it says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. And then the word today is faithfulness. Everybody say faithfulness. Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. As I looked at this word and I thought, I've taught on, of course, the fruit of the Spirit over the years. And as I looked at this, I said, Lord, I want to come at it from whatever angle you want. What do you want people to know? This is fresh bread coming out where God is speaking and it's not just something redone. And as I prayed about it, I said, well, let me just look that word up in the original language. I, that's kind of where I love to start because it gives me new perspective. And when I looked up this word faithfulness, it's, and I put it in your note there, it's a Greek word called pistos, and it's a word that is found 244 times in the Bible, in the New Testament, 244 times. But 239 times it is translated as faith, not faithness, faithfulness, but faith. And that just kind of began to stir some images inside of me, faith instead of faithfulness, like that the fruit of the Spirit is faith. And then how does that tie in with this concept of faithfulness as we're looking at it and thinking about it? Because this word is a noun. It's originally a noun, which is faith. And faith is a word that means you believe God's promises. It's whatever God says you believe. And that it's 
true, it's certain, and you can base your life on it. And especially when you're having faith about Jesus Christ. When you believe God's word about what he said about Jesus as being Lord and God, and he died on the cross for our sins, and if you'll only believe in him, you shall have eternal life. And that's called the good news. How many of y'all think that's good news? You know, when you think of that, but that's the, the concept of this, is believing God, that somewhere in there there's this fruit that rises up that we can believe God, that it's supernaturally you know, and it says actually faith comes by hearing the word, that the word of God has power to produce in us this ability to believe God's promises, and it is supernatural. But as I thought of that from a concept of faithfulness, like why do these, these translators in the New International Version use it? They were trying to put them together, I think, gentleness and kindness and goodness, faithfulness and as I did some research just on the meaning of that word it, it just really began to jump out of me as an adjective one that modifies the word or supports it there's four areas and they're on your notes there number one that faithfulness is a thorough performance of a duty like a faithful worker like you're a faithful worker a faithful teacher you're a faithful whatever your duty is and you're carrying out you're faithful at doing that and then number two part of the definition means it's true to one promises or the vows that you've taken. Like you're a faithful spouse. You've promised to love and obey and sickness and health and until death do you part. We make those, but not everybody can remain faithful to those. But that's really what it means. You keep your promises. But also number three, it means to be steadfast in allegiance or affections. And that word allegiance really jumped off the page to me. Like a faithful soldier is. He's got an allegiance to support that flag, that nation, that corps, that branch of the military, his men, his army that he fights with, his nation. Or someone that has really that faithful affection, They're the friend that never leaves you or forsakes you. And then the number four is someone is faithful, they have faithfulness if they adhere to the truth or standard, like a faithful disciple, like they always follow the word. And as I looked at every one of those concepts around faithfulness, they all apply to every relationship that we're in, and they all apply essentially to our relationship with God that we are faithful workers for him and his kingdom, that we are faithfully honoring a covenant like a spouse. We are in covenantal relationship with God, that we're also a faithful allegiance. We're like soldiers, you know, in a battle, fighting the, the work with him. And we're also, though, adhering to a standard, the truth, the word of God. You see, we're faithful because God's word is true. Amen. You see, when you understand what this is, this word is it's so much bigger and more important to us. And in fact, it's a very powerful word and it's involved in every relationship. In fact, it's one of the areas that if you want to talk about faith and you really do some of the research in one place in Malachi, the Old Testament, the prophet was conversing what God's heart was. He says, I don't want you to divorce because when you do, you're breaking faith. Breaking faith because you're not keeping your promises and that breaks hearts of God. And that's why he's such a covenant keeping God. That's why he speaks to us about that and what faith is and being in faith. And when they asked Jesus about, you know, divorce, they said, he said, well, there's an area that if there was a reason, it would be because of the lack of unfaithfulness. Because of the unfaithful, if a partner is unfaithful, they're not faithfulness, then that is the break that can end a marriage. In fact, all over the world, you think about relationships, but especially the marriage one. In every culture, among atheists, among Hindus, among everyone, there's this concept that when a man and a woman are married, there's this understanding almost in every culture that this is supposed to be kept just between us two. That, you know, you can't be unfaithful to a spouse. It just doesn't like, not very many spouses say, yeah, go out and hang out and do whatever you want to with everybody else. There's kind of an understanding, hey, this is just me and you thing, amen? So that concept of being faithful 
is right where Satan is always trying to break you, trying to tempt you, trying to get you to sidestep this because there's a breaking of a relationship. But I want to share with you one passage of scripture about Jesus' teaching. When they were asked, you know, he asked Jesus, they asked Jesus to help us increase our faith. Let me show you that because he taught them the very first thing is that you increase your faith by obedience. Let's look at our passage in Luke 17, beginning at verse 3. Jesus is teaching his disciples about forgiveness. And he begins and he says, if another believer sins, you can rebuke that person. If they're not a believer, you shouldn't be messing with them, amen? And you had no reason to tell them they're right or wrong because they're following their own principle. But once somebody becomes a true follower of Christ, we have an open door to encourage them in their walk, just as Pastor Barber said. Let's encourage one another to stay the, the course. You can rebuke that person. Then if there's repentance, forgive. Even if that person wrongs you, now all of a sudden he takes it to another level. Not only are they just sinning, but now they're wronging you. How many of y'all know that's when it gets personal right there? When they wrong you seven times a day and each time turns and asks for forgiveness, what must you do? You must forgive. It's not an option. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. You must forgive. And then the apostle said to the Lord, so this is his close apostles, the disciples. He says, show us how to increase our faith. Show us how to increase our faith. Now we know that faith means you believe God's promises and that you align them with your life, that you're able to obey them, to follow them. They're not the great suggestions although they're amazingly wonderful for building our lives and our marriages and our businesses around. But there's times where Jesus is very clear, their commands. And at this moment, the disciples are saying, wait a minute, I got this part now. If someone sins, I can rebuke them. Okay, I'm pretty good at that. I'll take that on, amen. But when it comes down to me having to forgive them over and over and over again, Jesus, you must be talking about something that we don't know about. In fact, you need to help us have greater faith because we don't think we can do that. In fact, we're not going to do that. We're not able to do that. That's really what they're debating with Jesus is we don't have the faith, Jesus, that it takes to forgive somebody over and over again. Now, I don't know about you, but probably everyone in the sound of my voice has been hurt and wounded by someone, has been sinned against. And hopefully many of you, if you're a follower of Christ, you have forgiven. But I know that within the sound of my voice is also people who say it's just too hard. Pastor, you just don't know the pain I've been through and that they wounded me, they abused me, they mistreated me, they humiliated me, they broke me, they messed my life up forever. You just don't know, and I just can't forgive them. I just don't have it in me. And I think that's what these apostles were saying. We just don't have it in us, Jesus. Like, you gotta somehow tell us how to get enough faith so that we're able to do that. Now, he, they've asked a question, and now Jesus goes into giving them a two-part answer. And that's what I want to deal with this morning is just the two answers that Jesus says when we need more faith, and especially when we need faith to forgive. And he goes on in that sentence there, and he says that this, and then the Lord answered them after saying, increase our faith, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed. You could say to this mulberry tree, and there must have been some type of tree right nearby where they could point it was very large, very stable, very alive. You could say to this mulberry tree, may you be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would do what? It would obey you. That in this first answer, he's telling him, about a very small faith, but there's a connection of obedience. That the tree will obey because it has to obey because it responds to faith. 
Now, we get all hung up in, uh, you know, let me see if I can make the tree jump and move. And I used to, as a kid, I, I would try to make a typewriter fly across the room, you know, and all those weird things. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is talking about miraculous things can happen even with the smallest amount of faith. But the reaction is obedience to the one who commands. And that's what he was trying to teach them at this moment is that forgiveness is not an option and it doesn't even take great faith. It just takes a little faith. That if you believe in Jesus Christ as Lord, that's faith. That's already more than enough faith to do everything he's ever commanded you to do. That following Jesus is not going to be a hard life. It's not going to be an impossible life. That he wouldn't ask you to do things that you could not carry out. That's what Jesus is trying to teach his disciples here. That there has to be a response in that. There is no place there. They're almost like saying, well, I would try, I'll try to forgive. I don't know if you've ever been there, but I've gone through cycles in my life where the wound was so great I tried to forgive. I thought I had forgiven until I saw that person again and all those emotions and pains just came filling back into my heart. I was trying to forgive and not forgiving. It reminded me as I thought of this concept of how uh, there was this great philosopher, his name was Yoda. Any of y'all know who Yoda is? If you're a Star Wars fan, you know, the space op movie, you'll know Yoda. He's the little guy that uh, had all the wisdom and everything. And he's working with Luke Skywalker on a planet trying to help him discover his powers. And in there, he's trying to get him to, with his force of mental super whatever power those people had at, that in those time being the Jedi, that he could raise this speeder, this spaceship out of the mud. Any of y'all remember that place and time? Well, let me just go back and you say, why is he bringing this up? What is that? Well, first of all, it's a good illustration. Secondarily, I've, I've actually done research and the guy that wrote that and designed that, a mon much of the themes, he actually got them right from the Bible the dark force and the power and, you know, all these other things. So he was using the stories of timeless truth to build one of the greatest uh, movies also. But that's not the point. The point is when he says, raise that with your power, Luke, and Luke says, well, I will try. And Yoda responds back to him and says, do or do not. There is no try. Do or do not, there is no try. And I really believe that's what Jesus is trying to say to his disciples. If the smallest amount of faith that you have, you either forgive or you do not, there is no try. That within you is all the power of the Holy Spirit giving you everything you need if you respond to this with obedience. You know that all through this, this series I've been saying, well, the fruit of the Spirit is something He supernaturally is working in you, but each and every time we're having to respond to the Holy Spirit and align with and agree with and obey with our lives, whether it's love and joy or peace or patience. All those take a response from us. We're not going to just supernaturally be overcome with kindness that we don't want or need. And the same thing with faithfulness. There is no try. There is a place where we come, especially with forgiveness, when we say the wound is so deep and so terrible, you just don't understand that I can't forgive. I can't forgive really means I won't forgive. I'm making a choice. I will not forgive. It's too hard. It's too difficult. It's impossible just as raising a speeder would be impossible, just as a mulberry tree being jerked from its roots and cast in the sea. And Jesus is saying, no, it's not impossible. If you believe, if you believe, if you have the faith as small as a grain of mustard seed, you choose and then supernatural power is then made available. There is no try. 
you know, it's like our thought, I will try to follow Jesus, but I'm not so good at it. No, there's enough power in you that raised Jesus from the dead. The same Holy Spirit will give you power to live a life for him, amen? You know, there is no I won't. It reminded me, and I've told it a few times, but I remember as a 16-year-old and I went to live with my father. I'd been away from him due to a divorce and he retired from the military and he's now trying to farm and a little farm and I wanted to, I joined the basketball team and the, there was a night we were supposed to be practicing at the, uh, you know, that night if I wanted to be on the team, I had to practice and my dad said, you got a bicycle, you can go, but today you can't even do that because there's a field that needs plowing. The plowing must get done because we have to start planning or miss the cycle. And I said, but you don't understand that I got to go to practice and that's what I, I want to go to practice and we'll get the field later. He said, no, the field will be finished today. And I don't know what happened in me, but now I want to just tell you that my dad, I can never remember, I can never remember, I'm sure it happened, I never remember him spanking me, hitting me, touching me, doing anything, harming me in any way. He was always the gentlest of men. But that day, I, my 16-year-old great rebellious self that I was and who you are when you're a teenager, when he said, you'll go plow the field, I said, I will not. And he turned around and he gave me a look that said, I am dead. I don't know what went on, but my, I was like shaking in my boots immediately. And he looked at me and he said, son, we can discuss this. Anytime you have an issue with anything I've ever asked you to do, it's always for your benefit. We can talk about it, but you will never, ever tell me no. When I give you a command, it is expected to be followed. Is that understood? And I said, yes, sir. If you need me, I'll be over here in the field. Amen. <laughs> you know, he taught me great lessons about respect, about authority, about the importance of some things come before fun and what we think is important at work and seriousness and getting the job done and timely manners and whatever needs to be done. And so, so I learned so much from that. But he, I never told him no again. I knew that I got one warning and it was pretty clear. We don't try, we will. But I want you to also see that I think what Jesus was trying to say is with just even the smallest amount of faith within you, that you're just moments away from a possible miracle. That a miracle that will be open because of obedience. That God has asked you to do something and you refuse or you don't think you have enough faith or you can. Or, I can't witness. I can't speak to them. I can't pray. I can't do that. I can't serve. I won't serve. I can't do this. I won't give. You see, there's a, a level of your response that Jesus is just waiting to uproot mulberry trees, move your mountains, change your life, set you in order just because you will obey. And that's the power of what we see in here and what he's trying to say, faithfulness. The inside God wants from you is faithfulness. Inside God has given you the spirit. He wants you to stand in faith. He wants you to believe God's word is true and promise, but also that you can line your life up with it and he wants you to align and agree and live according to the commands he has given you. Amen. He goes on though to answer this in another way like Jesus sometimes does. And he tells a story because it's trying to teach them that we can increase our faith by allegiance. He is trying to bring back to them, and he tells them a story. They said, increase our faith, and he says, you've already got it, even if it's just a grain of a mustard seed. Okay, increase our faith. Well, let me tell it this way. In Luke 17, 7, when a servant comes in from plowing or taking care of sheep, it's really not important what the role was. It was important that he was doing what he had been commanded to do. He comes in, does his master say, come in and eat with me? No, he says, prepare my meal, put on your apron and serve while I eat. 
then you can eat later. And then does the master then thank the servant for doing what he was told to do? Of course not. In the same way, everyone say in the same way. See, he's trying to say this is exactly the same way. In the same way, when you obey me, you should say, we're unworthy servants who have simply done our duty. I have read this passage all my life, over 40 years of being saved and in the word of God. I have looked at these things and struggled with them. And even as you look here and you say, well, that doesn't sound very loving. That doesn't sound very nice. Uh, it seems like, why would he take advantage of the servant? And why would he, you know, I get caught up in all the arguments of where we are. And that's not what Jesus was trying to say. Because you'll never outlove Jesus. You'll never outserve Jesus. You'll never do more for him than he has done for you. So that's not the issue. He's not about getting something done. He's about you understanding what we do when we hear a command. That the servant there is there and he responds. It's called duty. And sometimes we look at that, well, I have a duty to my marriage and we rebel. I have a duty to my nation. We might rebel. We have a duty to the church. We have a duty to all these things. And sometimes we think that's a bad word. It's a word that really means allegiance. It's a promise. Allegiance means you're, you make a promise to be loyal to either a person, a group, or a cause. And as I thought about that, that's really what Jesus has asked us to do, is to follow him. He wants allegiance where he says, I want loyalty to the person, Jesus Christ, to the group, the church of the living God, which is his body, and to the cause, the advancement of the kingdom of God on earth. Amen. Amen. He wants someone that will step up and say, I'm your servant. I am following you. Not because I had to, but because I chose you. Because you chose me and because you've saved me. You've changed me. You've filled me. You've saved, given me eternity and now you've given me your Holy Spirit. It's not because I have to do it. It's because I get to do it. And when it's done, we shouldn't even be like patting ourselves on the back. You're like We go around, we finally forgive somebody. Look what I did, Jesus, I did that, you know. Look what I did, I, I helped feed that person over there or clean up after the storm. Or, hey, Jesus, look what I did. I read your Bible every day this week, you know. And he's saying, that's your duty. Don't be looking for a pat on the back. Look for an opportunity to serve. That's what Jesus is calling all of us into. And that when we get it out of our mind that we don't have a place where we can say, I can't do this, because that really just means I won't do it. And what Jesus is saying, have your allegiance. Like we used to sing or pray in the, in the schools, I pledge allegiance to the flag for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. We used to teach our kids to be loyal and allegiance to a cause. And now we're teaching them, no, rebel against all causes. Because you're in charge. It's all about you. There's a place where we need to realize that we make a promise to Jesus. It's going to last a lifetime. That's what faithfulness is. It's not this week while it's easy. No, it's for the rest of your life when it's hard. You're tired. You come in from the field and you want to be pampered. You want to have somebody hold you and rub your shoulders and prepare your food. And Jesus is saying, I've already given you everything. Now, just go with great allegiance and serve with all that you got. We have allegiance because we've already been bought with a price. That's what it says. You've been bought with a price the precious blood of Jesus we no longer belong to ourselves we belong to him that's what the scripture says to us and then he says right after that you've been bought with a price therefore honor God with your body you're struggling with faithfulness 
Remember him who is faithful. That's what in Deuteronomy 7, 9, we like, well, he's expecting more of us. No, God only wants from us what he is because that's who our image is. It says in Deuteronomy 7, 9, it's th- so many places it says he is a faithful God. He is a faithful God keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations to those who love him and keep his command. You see, he wants us like him, that we're loyal, that we have an allegiance, we have a duty, and it's our honor and privilege to lay down our lives and take his hill and go where he sends and follow his commands because he's worthy of all the praise. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. Lord, it helps us understand you so much that it's not about you pushing us around. No, you've already laid down your life. You bought us with the precious blood that you've given. Now, Lord, we want to just make our declaration that you're our Lord. You're our God. You're our master. You're in charge of our lives. And where you say go, we go. Where you say stay, we stay. And when you say what you want done, we say yes, sir. Because it's an honor to serve you, to follow you. Because we know in the end, you only want the very best for us. So Lord, while we're still praying, you're here or you're watching online, you don't know Jesus as Lord, as Master. You know about him, you want him as Savior, you want him to meet your list of needs. And he's saying, follow me, lay down your life. I'm gonna lead you in a prayer, let's just pray out loud. Say, Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sin, I choose Jesus. I believe he died for my sins so I could be forgiven. And now he lives in me. Come lead my life. I'm going to follow you. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give praise to God for every one of those decisions. If you made some kind of decision today, all you got to do is text decision to 302-838-0603. I've got some helpful information that we'll email it to you and we'll just get it there. And if you have any other prayer requests, you can, there's a place there to put those too. It's just to help you decision to the church telephone number. God bless you. It is such an amazing time. We have such an honor and duty to serve our Lord. Amen. Come on, let's give God praise for his work. God bless you. Go with God. He goes with you.